Jesus, keep me near the cross. That was a good job on that. Thank you for playing that. James chapter 1, let's begin reading in verse number 1, and we'll get into the word. <clears throat> the Bible says this, uh, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which were scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that she may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. And if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that give it to all men liberally and upbraid it not, and to it shall be given him. And let faith, let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like the wave of a sea, the sea dr driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. All right. The Bible says, if any man of you, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. We have uh, a lot of promises like this where we ask for something and we receive it from the Lord. John O'Rice said, prayer is asking and receiving. And uh, that is true. Uh, the Bible says in the book of James, you have not because ye ask not. And so we have this promise given to us that if we lack wisdom, we can just ask of God and he'll give it to us. So tonight I want to talk about wisdom for a few minutes and how we all lack it and how we all need it. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, that you just please bless the sermon, God. I pray, Lord, that we would, Lord, allow you to bring wisdom into our life, Lord, knowing that you are uh, all wise, full of wisdom, Lord, uh, and ready to dispense it to us as we need it. Lord, I pray that you just bless this sermon. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, uh, as we started out the, the book, we said the book of James is uh, written by James, and uh, we talked about how it was written to the 12 tribes scattered abroad, probably from James that was in Jerusalem, one of, one of the, uh, uh, or the, the elder there, the, the bishop there of the church, and he is sending this out to uh, the scattered, the diaspora, those who have been uh, who are all over the place that are Christians, who have a Hebrew heritage. And he says, here's how you should live, and here's some things for you. Now, we know from the book of Acts that it wasn't easy to be a Christian in the first century. And um, in, in many places in the world today, it's not easy to be a Christian. And we had the admonition to, to count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. And notice in verse 4 it says, But let patience have her perfect work, right? Because the trying of our faith worketh patience. God brings things into our lives to test us, to see if we're going to have faith in Him, what kind of, uh, if we're going to do right when the going gets tough. And He also uses those hardships to, to bring uh, about perfection in our life. And he says, let patience have her perfect work, uh, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. And so uh, the word wanting there is, in verse 4 um, is actually the same, is translated from the same Greek word that's translated as lack in verse 5. So if you'll notice that again, if any of you lack wisdom, you know, let him ask in faith, uh, excuse me, um, sorry, verse 4, he says that she may be perfect and entire, wanting or lacking nothing. One of the biblical synonyms, King James synonyms, would be lack uh, uh, or want, right? So you could say it, you could reverse that around if you wanted to. Perfect, entire, lacking nothing. If any of you want for wisdom or lack wisdom, let him ask of God. So the, I guess the only point I really bring that up, the reason I bring that up to make a point, is that we, you know, we, if we let patience have a perfect work so that we lack nothing, one of those things that, that uh, comes out of the refining fires of troubles and trials and problems and tribulations is wisdom. It's one of the things that we lack or can lack. And maybe it was one of the things that they lacked. Um, and wisdom is, uh, the Bible says, is a principal thing. So it may be very well that, that the thing that they were lacking, or one of the things they were lacking in verse 4, is wisdom that was mentioned here. And so we link trials in the Christian life in the development of godly wisdom. And I believe this is true. And, you know, the refiner's fire, if allowed to do its work, uh, brings purity 
It brings character and it brings wisdom. And if you've been around very long, you've been through some trials, you've been through some hardships, you've been through uh, people treating you wrong, you've been through a lot of things like that. Uh, if you handle it right, the Lord begins to, to uh, develop you into the person he wants you to be and you develop wisdom. You know, people today, they like to try to avoid all pain and suffering. I mean, you know, like they can't eat any food if it doesn't taste perfectly you know, perfect, right? Like, or, uh, you know, um, they have to have everything perfect, you know, like, well, that would be too much work to do that, right? But if it were not for pain and suffering, you know, none of us would be here today, would it? Would we? You know, and the ladies on this one can say amen if they wanted to, but it is a lot of pain and suffering. And any of the mothers could say uh, amen to that. It's, it's called labor and travail, right? And so if, if uh, ladies didn't decide to, to go through that, a lot, of, a lot of people, you'd be surprised how many women out there are just like, well, I don't want to go through the hardship. They'll say, I don't want to go through that pain. Uh, first of all, it hurts. And then number two, you know, uh, you know I might not be as uh, the weight that I want to be, and I might not be this or that, or, you know, it might, it's going to be hard. And so, uh, but, you know, everything in life that's worth something is hard. It, it, it's just the way it is. And so, um, you know, we need to do uh, challenge ourselves and allow God to put us through the fire and and um, to make us in order to have God's to have that maturity. We're going to have to go through some hard things and do some hard things. We're going to have to be obedient to God and step out by faith. You know, every time that we step out by faith and we trust God with some trial and affliction, some problem, then you know, and God shows Himself to us. Now we have more faith. We have experience, and we, can now, we now know firsthand that God is going to help us and provide for us and give us what we need. And so it's all, it all comes down to this just lifetime experience of just growing and learning and, and uh, going through hard times and God helping us, us relying upon Him. And so when it comes to this wisdom, God will make us wise. Um, but we have to be humble enough to see that we need his wisdom, right? So he says this, the first thing he says is, if any of you lack wisdom. Now, is there anybody here so bold as to say, well, I don't need God's wisdom. I don't need it. Anybody want to raise their hand and say that? Wisdom from God? Well, sometimes we act like that. That's the problem, right? And it, it might be a theme like a funny thing to say, who doesn't lack wisdom? Um, who doesn't need a big dose of wisdom from God every day? Well, we all do. But, you know, in reality, often we don't seek that wisdom. We don't pray about things. Like we don't pray about big decisions or little decisions. We're not having that pray without ceasing situation. Uh, God, help me with this. You know, even the smallest things, like when you're in your car driving or, uh, you know, uh, with conversations when you're talking to people. How many times have you kicked yourself uh, from walking away from a conversation? You say, well, you know what? There was a big open door to, to talk to them about the Lord. You can pray for wisdom about how to share your faith with other people. There's all kinds of things that we need wisdom for every day. But, but we get arrogant. We don't seek God's wisdom. And I think that's what it is when we're relying upon our own wisdom right? Isn't that what the Bible says? Not to lean upon our own understanding. In all our ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct our path. We need that wisdom and it's available to all of his people all the time. But how do we get it? It's simple, isn't it? We ask. And before we take this in total context here in the passage, I want to just talk about wisdom for a minute. What is wisdom? What is wisdom and where does it come from? Uh, where does this wisdom come from? Well, in the 1828 dictionary, I like this one. The right, the wisdom is the right use or exercise of knowledge, the choice of laudable ends, and a best means to accomplish them. This is wisdom in act, effect, or practice. If wisdom is to be considered as a faculty of the, of the mind, it is the faculty of discerning or judging what is the most proper, just, and useful. And if it is to be considered as an acquirement, in this, uh, it is the knowledge and use of what is best, most just, most proper, most conductive to prosperity or happiness. Wisdom in the first sense or practical wisdom is nearly synonymous with discretion. It differs somewhat from prudence in this respect. Prudence is the exercise of sound judgment in avoiding evils. Wisdom is the exercise in sa of sound judgment either in avoiding evils or attempting good. 
Prudence, then, is a species of which wisdom is the, the genus. Um, and so I think that's a good definition. And as Christians, you know, the, I, listen, everybody out there is choosing between good and bad. And sometimes they choose a bad, but, you know, anybody can choose between good and bad. But a Christian is supposed to seek that wisdom, which is from above, and to discern that, you know, even more, like, what is God's best for my life? Yeah. What is the best thing, right? Uh, the, what is the best word in this situation I can speak? What is the best thing I can do in this situation? And I think that's a good de definition. Dictionary.com says uh, wisdom is the word. Uh, it gives this as like they have an article on the difference between knowledge and wisdom, and I, I like the way it says this. The word knowledge is defined as the acquaintance with facts, truth, or principles from as from study or investigation. You know, we are bombarded with information. We've got our cell phone. You can like, you have a, a thought. You can just be like, hello, Google. And let me ask you a question real quick. What is this? What is this? What is this? We have information at our fingertips all day long, but information does not, having information or knowledge or uh, skills that you've learned doesn't make you wise. There's a difference between having knowledge and having, uh, you know, wisdom. You know, uh, Gunny can attest to this. A lot, of, a lot of those officers in the Marine Corps had book knowledge, but they didn't have any of the common sense, right? They didn't have that. We talk about this. I'm not, ta I don't, I'm not talking any trash about officers. You know, I don't have any problem with them, uh, you know, but um, we just a conversation we'd have. Uh, a lot of times uh, they don't, they, they have a lot of education, but they don't have wisdom. And sometimes you'll see people with, um, you know, lots of college degrees after their name, but they don't have uh, the wisdom. What is the difference between, well, they got facts and knowledge. They can tell you, they can beat you at trivial pursuits and they can, they can sit there and watch Jeff, Jeopardy and, uh, you know, tell you all the facts, but is that really making a difference in their life? Well, the word wisdom is defined as the state of being wise, which means having the power of discernment and judge, judging properly what is true or right. Uh, possessing discernment, judgment, or discretion. Now, let's do some synonyms for knowledge versus synonyms for wisdom. Knowledge would be ability, awareness, education, expertise, familiarity, grasp, okay? Synonyms for wisdom would be experience, foresight, judgment, prudence, and those types of things. So this is important to understand. And there are, are tons of people out there who are knowledgeable. They have many hours of classes and degrees behind their names, uh, they, but they lack wisdom. Filling your head with knowledge does not necessarily mean that you are going to be wise, okay? You may have tons of facts in your head about a topic, but you may not know how to use it to make good decisions in your life. And that's why, as Christians, we have an advantage in life because we have at, at our fingertips uh, the source of all wisdom, Amen. Jesus Christ. <clears throat> in this way, we all need wisdom. You think about it, you know. God knows. God is all-knowing. He is all-wise. He is everywhere at all times. And he's willing to impart to us wisdom for our situation when we need it and when we ask for it. It is there for us if you ask for it. You say, well, I have a big decision facing me. Well, have you asked God for wisdom about it? And then listened? <laughs> Think about it. Let's say your dilemma or your situation involves other people. Now, here's the advantage you have. You have a God who knows what the other people are thinking and what's in their mind. And he can actually influence other people so he can actually give you the words to say and help you to do the right, mo or the right action uh, to bring forth a good, good, good end for everyone. God can plot your, a perfect chorus of action for your life. So I believe the number one thing we need, need is wisdom. And, and it, it, the number one thing we need wisdom for is discerning good and evil. Okay? Not for financial gain, not to how to survive a nuclear holocaust or anything like that. But the number one thing we need is uh, to discern good and evil. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. 
if we can learn to please God in our lives, everything else is going to be great. In Hebrews chapter 5, we have um, sort of a same idea given here, but I want you to notice this. He says in verse 11, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing here a dull of hearing. So there's wisdom that needs to be imparted to these people, but they're not, they're, they're not able to hear it. For, for uh, when, for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not strong meat. Now, let me ask you a question. If these people are in a situation where they don't have the basics of Christianity down, I mean, where, what's, what decisions are they going to be making on a daily basis? Not going to be the best decisions. I mean, they might make them all the best decisions on accident. But, but you think about it, like we need this wisdom that's from above, and the most important thing that gets everything else lined up is this idea of, of you know, doing right and wrong, the first principles of the oracles of God. He says this, For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe, but strong meat believe, belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So in, according to this verse, um, basically what you see here is that as you mature, right, because the Bible says here that uh, if anyone lack wisdom, right, in this idea that you are going to be made perfect and entire, right, we need these trials and troubles to make us perfect and entire in James chapter 1, uh, and patience having a perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting or lacking nothing, if any of you lack wisdom, you so, I mean, that is one of the things that God gives us as we grow in the Christian faith, and what we see here is that you know, those who are a full age of maturity, they've gained some wisdom. And what is it that they've gained? Uh, uh, the ability to discern good and evil. A baby Christian gets wisdom by using the knowledge of the Word of God to apply it to their lives, and then they see the difference that God makes in their life. That's how it works. Um, we were out soul winning uh, on Sunday, and... Um, you know, we ended up, Brother Frank and I ended up going to a house on Monday, and I, I like what Brother Frank said says, and we were talking to a man, and he said, you know, give God a try. Give God a try. You know, uh, you're saved, you know, and you're struggling. Well, how about trying it God's way? Do it God's way. And uh, you're, gonna have, you're never going to regret it, and God's just going to bless you. And, um, but people just have a hard time letting go. But... Amen. That's a perfect verse. Amen. Um, and the one I wrote down that I was thinking about is in Malachi 3 that came to my mind, right, where he says, and I know it's about money, he says in Malachi 3.10, bring ye tithes into the storehouse that, ye, that there ye, uh, may be meat in mine house, and prove it to me now there herewith, say the Lord of hosts, and I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. So he just says, try it. Try me. Try me. So, you know, just let go of the money. Be Look, you know, you say, well, I can't make it on with 10% less of my money. You can't make it with 10% more uh, of your money in your bank account if it's God's money, right? Because, uh, you know, he says, just try me. Try me. Prove me now herewith. I will give you, open up the windows of heaven. And in the Christian life, there's a lot of promises like that. I mean, think about what he goes on to say. He says, well, I will, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. Think about this. I mean, he's basically saying, well, you know, if you can just surrender to Jesus in this matter of tithing, but it goes for other matters too, in, in discerning good and evil and, and church attendance and Bible reading, and you start surrendering. The Lord, I mean, you could do it. The way of the transgressor is hard. I mean, or you can go with the Lord, and he says, you know what? I'm, I'm going to rebuke the devourer, and I'm going to make sure that your your crops come in, and you're bountifully blessed. And God's, he said, I'm just going to bless you with more and more and more because I can trust you with it. And he says, And all nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, this is not prosperity preaching. You know, I don't think, 
you know, God's probably got in, in mind for all of us to be like, you know, filthy rich or anything, but he's promised to provide our needs. He's, he's promised to help us through these things. And so he says, just try them. If you're struggling with finances, tithe. Amen. You know, uh, you're struggling in some area. Well, then, you know, surrender to the Lord and, and go to church uh, three times a week. Surrender to the Lord and read your Bible with your family every day. Surrender to the Lord. Uh, you're, you're, you're having trouble. Surrender to the Lord. How many promises are there in the Bible of God's blessings if we'll follow the Lord? They're all over the place. They're plentiful. Turn over to Psalms 1, Galatians 5. I had this, the privilege of reading these passages to a drunkard this week. And um, by the way, hallelujah, God saves drunkards. Amen. Amen. I mean, you know, uh, praise God, this, this gentleman, like, he, um, I knocked on his door, and I could tell something was wrong with him. He was high, uh, or, or drunk, I guess it was, and um, he told me to go away or whatever, and uh, went down a bunch more doors, and I had my family, and we were, I was leading the lady to the Lord down the road, and um, this is over near Western Boulevard, off the of Western Boulevard back there, and um, he said, uh, uh, she, I was giving her the gospel, and he pulls up. This guy pulls up in a pickup truck and gets out, and he comes over, and he's shaking, and he tells me, he said, hey, alcohol is destroying my life. I need help. And I said, well, I can help you. I'll be down in a minute. I'm talking to her. Uh, I knew where he lived, and I got his number. And um, I, he, was, he was drunk. So I told him, I said, you know, uh, he told me he was, he, uh, there was a whole thing with his family, and he's, he's worried about losing his privileges to be with his kids and stuff and this, this alcohol is wrecking his life and uh i told him i said you he had court in the morning so we prayed for that and i told him i'd be over monday after court got his number and um i told him not to drink you know you'd be sober clear-headed and i thought that would be perfect time and um i was able to brother frank met me over there at three o'clock and i guess by three forty-five or so he trusted Jesus as his personal Savior. And um, I, told him, I told him it's not going to be easy necessarily. God can take that away from you, but, it, but it's, it, it may be a difficult. There's withdrawals and different things there. If he's been hard drinking, I don't know what he's going to be facing. But this, I had the privilege of being able to show him these two passages and say, look, if, you, if you'll do these things, your life is going to be, this, is, this could be the turning point in your life. And I told him there's many, many people, many drunkards throughout history that have gotten saved. And God's helped them through that. And now he's got way more chance. You know, he said he tried this 10-step programs and he relapsed. I said, now you got a, now you got a chance, brother. If you'll, if you'll do it God's way, he'll change your life. One step to Jesus. One step to Jesus. I think I might have even said that. And I gave him, uh, I gave him, I still have our you materials back there. And I gave him the 10 principles. I told him to read those one every day along with a chapter of the book of John. And um, so I'm going to be checking in on him every week. Uh, pray, pray for him. He's having trouble with, um, uh, he works a job where he has to serve alcohol. I showed him the scriptures on serving alcohol. And uh, he said he didn't want to do that job. He's going to work on seeing if he can, you know, find something better uh, to where he doesn't have to do that. But um, anyway, one step at a time, pray for him that he's able to come. We've asked him to take a, at least a Sunday off and come down and get baptized. Uh, and um, so, so praise the Lord. Be praying for him. I'm gonna, I plan on touching base with him once a week uh, until he t until he either comes or tells me to get lost. Um, we'll just keep trying to help him. And uh, it's not it's not an easy thing. But God, praise God. I, I'm telling you, um, we have an amazing. I showed him these verses right here, and you know, it's not complicated. It's not a complicated program, right? There's not 10 steps or anything, uh, but it's hard. It's not complicated, but it's hard. And it really boils down to um, what he did. He confessed his sin, right? That's good. And he needs, now as a Christian, he's got to repent of it. He's got to turn from it and say, God, help me to do this. And if he'll do what God said in his word, the steps are all laid out for us. Uh, did I have you turn to Psalms 1? Let's read it here. Psalms 1, I said this, I said, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. And I told him, I said, if you want a blessed life, if you want a life where God's blessing you and you got everything going your way, um, again, you're going to have to change your friends. 
I said, you, you need to stop hanging out with that drinking crowd. You don't need to be going to bars and clubs and all that stuff. You need to get go to church and hang out with the church-going crowd. And, um, and then I said, number two here, he says, but you, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law doth he meditate day and night. And I said, you need to get in the Bible. And I gave him, you know, gave him materials and, and so on. And I gave him a Bible reading checklist. And, you know, it really comes down to uh, walking in the Spirit, and you can overcome the flesh. I told him to get in the Word, stop living in the flesh, and feed in the flesh. Gave him some materials for that. And I said, in verse 3, it says, And ye shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. And I said, do you need that in your life, you know? Uh, and, and think about this. I mean, he, you know, he, he uh, has a degree and so forth, but, you know, his ways just not prospering. And I think it's because he's struggling with that addiction. So God's promised that he's going to do this for him. But the ungodly are not so, but are like the shaft which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. I gave him another promise out of Galatians 5, if we'll turn there real quick. And I said, Galatians chapter 5, the Bible says this, and again, it's, it's uh, simple. The plan is easy. It's not complicated. Um, but you know, you have to, you have to follow his plan. If you want deliverance, if you want, it's not, you know, it's, it's funny. Uh, you, you have this, um, I, I was talking about this revival, this As, Asbury revival. Um, you might, you might like my sermon. I know you, you had mentioned that you'd been following that thing. It's a mess up there, casting out demons and all this weird stuff. But one of the things that you notice when you listen to them, uh, you know, nobody's really, you know, like this, if they're, they're confessing sin, but it's this weird thing. Like, um, they're casting out the, the demon of this out of a person or I, in the name of God, I cast out the, you know, whatever out of you, you know, some, the spirit of, uh, you know, sin or whatever it is, name the sin or whatever. And, uh, it's, it's this weird thing where, you know, oh, we're, a, everybody's a victim of their sin. You know, I'm a victim of my sin. No, you're a sinner and you need to turn from it, confess it and do what God told you to do. Have some fear of God in your life. And say, you know what, you know, I, I don't want to have a destroyed life, so I'm going to go to the Lord and do what God wants me to do. God boils it down to this. He says this in verse 16, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. I mean, it really is that simple, isn't it? I mean, if you get up in the morning, you read your Bible and you're praying throughout the day, you're listening to sermons, you're listen, listening to the Bible on, on C, uh, MP3 or whatever. I mean, it, you know, um, that's that's how you are going to beat the lust of the flesh. Your flesh is always going to be there. But if you walk in the Spirit, you'll talk to the Lord and, and do things that are spiritual and, and all of that. And um, verse 17, the flesh lusteth against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh, But these are and these are contrary one to the other so that you cannot do the things you would. But if you be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now, and he goes on with a, all of these things. I, I said, now the works of the flesh are these, and it goes down through, and you see uh, drunkenness is one of the works of the flesh. It's a work of the flesh. So he says, walk in the Spirit, and you'll not fulfill the, the lust of the flesh. It, it is that was what it all boils down to. And then if you go down, and I pointed out verse 22, and I said, but the fruit of the Spirit, if you walk in the Spirit, this is what you're going to have. And I pointed at this page, and I said, do you need love in your life? And he goes, yeah. I said, do you need some joy in your life? And he had tears, didn't he, brother? Yeah, it was crazy. He said, I said, do you need some peace in your life? And he goes, yeah. I said, do you need some long-suffering? Do you ever lose your temper and do things, say things you shouldn't, not regret? He goes, yeah. Do you need some gentleness in your life? He goes, yeah. I, a goodness, faith, meekness, temperance? You need some temperance, don't you? He goes, yeah. I said, there, that's available to you starting today. The Holy Spirit's in you. If you'll wa start walking in the Spirit, I found some sermons I'm gonna send them. I have to. I have to do it. I, I um, found those. You, you were mentioning this, send them. I, I found my uh, "Woe Unto Babylon" series. I had two full-length sermons on drinking alcohol, so I'll send them that one maybe and kind of you know fire them up. Uh, you were telling me that, that 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 really helped you when you were struggling with some things when you were a, a new Christian, and so we'll definitely use that. And so anyway. Praise God. Turn over to James chapter 3. Um, 
people start at the wrong place, right? Uh, they want wisdom for success in business, finances, home life. And what they really need is wisdom for pleasing God and getting God's blessing in their life. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Um, you know, <clears throat> James chapter 3 is very, a, a very interesting and important passage dealing with the idea of wisdom. Now, <clears throat> it is important to talk about wisdom in the sense that there's two kinds of wisdom that we could have. In James chapter 3, verse 13, Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. The word meekness means softness of temper, mildness, gentleness, forbearance under injuries and provocations. So you could see somebody that's meek. They're, they're able to control themselves. Uh, they're not just flying off the handle. They're not just all of these things uh, going through hardships. They're able to just, they're just steady, right? They're mature. They're co they control themselves. So that's... <coughs> That's a spirit of meekness. And so here's another definition. In an evangelical sense, humility or resignation, submission to the divine will uh, without murmuring or peevishness, opposed to pride, arrogance, uh, or refractor, uh, refractoriness. I, I don't even know what refractoriness is. What is refractoriness? I don't know. Anyway, sorry I gave you that one. I should have just left that one off. Uh, but if you have bitter envying and strife, so verse four, 14, he goes, so if it's a person's wise... You know, then let him show you his wisdom in this way, meekness and uh, meekness of wisdom and a good lifestyle. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. The wisdom that descendeth, this wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. Okay, so what is envy and what is strife? Envy obviously is. Uh, when we look after so what we want from someone else, right? So, uh, you know, coveting, right? Same type of idea. We look, we, we just, you have people that are just lusting after the things of this world just all the time, right? And uh, strife is just fighting. Um, you know, people are always just fighting and bickering and all that kind of stuff. For where those things are, it's confusion and every evil work. Now, that's a really interesting thing. I'll, I'll cover all of this in more detail. I'm trying not to get into the weeds on this. But there's a lot that we need. So there's an earthly, sensual, devilish wisdom that has, this person may be considered worldly wise, but it's not the w wisdom that's from above. Now notice this, verse 17, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. So in verse 17, he contrasts worldly wisdom, the kind of wisdom that most people are seeking, the kind of wisdom that takes information and knowledge about maybe business, investing, you know, whatever, and then, you know, takes that information and makes good business decisions, right, that, that, that make you profits or whatever, knowing when to act or when to buy, when to sell, when to invest, that kind of thing. Or the kind of wisdom that's really better defined by the word, it could be defined by shrewdness. Um, shrewdness would be being shrewd would be having uh, or showing astute or sharp judgment in practical matters sometimes at the cost of moral compromise a shrewd businessman a cunning or tricky businessman that kind of thing uh, you know l trying to have wisdom that, that would allow you to beat your opponents at business or something like that but that wisdom that de that descends is does not descend from above that's earthly sensual and devilish the Bible says Envy and strife and confusion and every evil work. That's not the wisdom from above. So what is the wisdom that is from above? Well, quite simply here, uh, it is defined for us, and I, I love this, that it, it defines wisdom for us, and I think it's a great thing. But before we go through that real quick, and that'll be the last thing we do, but I, I want to um, pull, go over to Jay, uh, Proverbs chapter 4. And I want to just read a couple of verses to you. In Proverbs chapter 4, uh, Proverbs chapter 4, I want to remind us what the, uh, some other, another place where the Bible talks about wisdom. Because wisdom is so, so, so important. I'm not going to read the whole passage. I have it printed off here. But um, we started so late, so I'm just going to read a, a few highlights here. 
The Bible says in verse 5, Get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not. Neither decline from the words of my mouth. Forsake her not, she shall preserve thee. Love her, and she shall keep thee. Now, it's so important because he says, If any man lack wisdom, you know, this is the wisdom that comes down from above. And we should not forsake it. We should be constantly asking for it. And why do we need to ask for it all the time? Because situations in our lives change all the time. And so it's not one of these things where, well, I need wisdom, so I'm going to ask. No, we need to just keep asking and keep asking. Uh, wisdom is the principal thing. I mean, this is the most important thing. It's like, this is it. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. Exalt her, and she shall promote thee. She shall bring thee to honor, and when thou dost embrace her. Think about that. If we, we can ask God for this thing, this thing called wisdom, and if we'll ask him daily, what does it do? It exalts, it, it promotes thee, it exalts thee. Uh, she, it's going to bring you honor in your life if you'll embrace it. The Bible says she shall give thee to thee uh, thine head an ornament of grace, and a crown of glory shall uh, uh, she deliver unto you, to thee. And, he, and then he goes on and talks about uh, to his son. He says, Oh, hear, O my son, and receive my sayings, and the years of thy life shall be many. So do you want to live a long time? You know, ask God for wisdom. You know, this is one of the things. Seek after wisdom. Um, he says, I have taught thee in the ways of way of wisdom. I have led thee in the right paths. And when thou goest, thy steps shall not be straightened. And when thou runnest, thou shalt not stumble. I'd like to have that in my life. He says, take fast hold of instruction. Let her not go. Keep her, for she is thy life. Enter not into the path of the wicked. So now we have the, the, the worldly wisdom, the, the one that comes from below, right? And go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it. Pass not by it. Turn from it and pass away. And uh, you could go on and on and on here. Um, but he goes down to, he says, um, um, I think I'll just st stop there. But there's so much there, to, 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 so many promises that are tied in um, to this, this thing of wisdom, right? Verse 22, for they are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. Keep thy heart with all diligence for out of it, are the issues of life. So turn back to James chapter 3 and we'll, we'll finish up here. But um, Psalms 111 verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Amen. And Proverbs 1 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 9 10, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. So when you think about it, fools despise wisdom and instruction. Fools don't seek God's wisdom. He says, ask of God, and he'll give to you liberally, and he won't upbraid you. All right. James chapter 3, verse 17 defines wisdom for us quickly. Um, that wisdom which is from above is pure. Wisdom that's above is pure as opposed to sensual and devilish, right? Uh, it leads you to purity of life. It is peaceable. Notice... Um, he says here that it is peaceable. Verse 18 says, The fruit of, of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. We ought to send that to the president and to the CIA. <clears throat> Sending $50 billion, $60 billion, $100 billion of money we don't have to foment a war that we shouldn't be involved in. All right. Next one, gentle. Well, here's the fruit of the Spirit, isn't it? If you ask for wisdom, you're starting to get the fruits of the Spirit in your life here. All right. Another fruit, uh, gentle, having a mild or kindly, na uh, kindly nature or character, soft or temperate, mild. Uh, easy to be entreated. Easy to approach and ask a question. Easy to come to with a complaint or whatever. Um, and and that's, that's what it is. Uh, you, you know, there are certain people you can't approach. There, you walk on eggshells around them. You, you can't talk to that preacher. You can't talk to that wife or husband without everything is going to be used against them or something. Right? Uh, that's not a good thing. That's not a, a, a fruit of wisdom. Uh, that person is not wise. Uh, full of mercy. Full of mercy. The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression 
and by no means clearing the guilty. Um, this is benevolence and, and mildness and tenderness of heart, L or willing to overlook injuries and uh, willing to, to uh, forgive other people and so forth. Uh, full of good fruits. Well, there, I mean, by the way, so you seek wisdom and you get the, you get the whole package of the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against us there is no law. Without partiality. Uh, it, this is an inclination to favor one party or side uh, of a question more than another. An undue bias of mind towards one party or a side, which is apt to warp the judgment. Partial, partiality would uh, springs from the will and the affections rather than from love of truth and justice. So partiality would put family or nationality or preference or skin color or whatever above something that's right and uh, truth in a situation, in a decision. And then without hypocrisy. Jesus said, beware of hypocrites. Beware of the hypocrites. Amen. You know, hypocrisy is, is feigning to be what one is not. Concealing one's real character and motives. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. James 1.5 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that give it to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and he shall, it shall be given him. So the most important thing that we can learn to do is to please the Lord in our lives. To gain that wisdom to how to discern good and evil. And we'll have these wonderful things. And from he said, keep your heart for out of it are all the issues of life. Like you say, well, what about my finances? Trust God. Do what God said. Seek his wisdom, and all these things will, shall be added unto you. When we get the wisdom that's from above, we gain everything else that goes with it. Isn't that amazing? The windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. There's joy, joy, joy in my heart since Jesus made everything right. I gave him my old tattered garment. And he gave me a robe of pure white, and now I'm feasting on manna from heaven, and that's why I'm happy tonight. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of the law. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Unto thee. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that give it to all men liberally, and upbraideth not. And it shall be given him. What a blessing. What a blessing it is. He gives you liberally, meaning it's plenty. He'll give you, and he'll not, he'll not fuss you out over it. He, he won't upbraid you or scold you. Oh, you again? Praise God. You need more wisdom, you idiot. Didn't I give you enough last time? Nope. And it shall be given him. Praise God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, how we all need wisdom. Lord, help us to seek you for it every single day. Please bless us as we go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Let's sing our closing chorus.